Good afternoon. It's great to be back. Last year I was on stage talking about the race to 5G and uh, by now you will obviously all understand that we're in the middle of the race. And I'm of course very happy, thrilled to see the US first out of the gate. So already in October, we launched the first network in the US, Verizon, the fixed wireless solution, home broadband. AT&T came out in December with a second device, a mobile network uh, puck. And yesterday, Verizon then launched the first smartphone. So by all means, we are ahead of the game, first out and uh, doing really well. I'm super excited about that. And of course, the investment in the US right now by all five leading carriers is significant. Networks are being built as we speak and more will launch in the immediate near term. I let my, my peers talk about that in a second. But uh, of course, there's a lot of activity around the world as well. I mean, we heard Korea is launching three networks tomorrow. We've been busy since we were here last time. So we're, as a matter of fact, rolling out 18 networks with announced customers across the globe. And networks are ready to go in Switzerland, Australia, uh, the GPP countries, and of course, China. So, I mean, there is a lot of activity in the world. And we have also been busy trying to understand what we're going to do with all those networks. So, of course, we have a consumer lab division that does research on consumer interest. Uh, we're working now with 31 industrial players not because we're selling to industries, but because we're trying to understand all these use cases that everybody's talking about. What are they going to be good for? Uh, so in the last 12 months, we've had 10 additional partnerships signed up with industrial players, which are really working with us to understand what's the value for industries, which I happen to believe is really the big, where the big new excitement is going to be. And to Michelle's point, that's where we're going to see a whole new ecosystem and business develop, jobs created. Um, so I wanted to give you a couple of examples on that. Last year I was probably a little bit, um, what shall I say, skeptical to the consumer use case, enhanced mobile broadband. Are our customers really going to be able to monetize enhanced mobile broadband or is this first and foremost new technology to drive out cost? Because that's of course one of the important value propositions. You produce a gigabyte at a tenth of the cost, but is there net new revenues? And we see it in the US. We see it in Korea, which we've been following very closely. A lot of excitement around mixed and augmented reality in stadium type environments. So we think that there absolutely is incremental revenue and the willingness, appetite by consumers to pay for additional devices to come into the data bucket. So I'm much more optimistic now, 12 months later, about the consumer proposition. And uh, I'd be surprised if you're not going to hear from Ronan and Neville about fixed wireless, which is also a consumer play where the US in particular is real bullish on what we can do there. So big believer today in the consumer business, but I'm gonna spend most of my time on the industrial internet of things, which is where I think the real action is gonna be. Industries have to transform. Every industry has a digital transformation agenda, and nowadays every industry has a digital wireless transformation agenda to improve their total cost of ownership, their consumer experiences, but also to take new market shares. So no industry out there that is not considering and trying to understand what 5G can do to transform their business. So here's some nuggets. I mean, we of course tried to do a little bit to ourselves. So we took augmented reality into one of our factories in Tallinn, and we basically allowed our testers to overlay when they're uh, troubleshooting circuit boards with augmented reality instructions and manuals and what to look for. Uh, so that they can troubleshoot much faster. And we have seen a 50% improvement in basically testing our own equipment. So 50% is pretty significant for any industry doing testing. Uh, example from this neck of the woods, Boeing, for instance, when they produce an airliner, a 747-800, which is basically the extended cargo plane, they deploy 130 miles of cables in that plane. It takes forever and every plane is basically custom built. So by using augmented reality, when their installation crews go at it, they've been able to take out 25% of the lead time in deploying those cables. That's massive, massive savings, uh, great impact for them. Uh, we work with a Swedish trucking manufacturer, um, in Ian Ride, they do electrical trucks, and we've been working with uh, um, a manufacturing site in, in southern Sweden where they basically have five trucks going between two factory warehouses, six, seven miles apart, and uh, five drivers in those trucks going back and forth. They said if we replace that with autonomous trucks, 
not only can we reduce the electrical autonomous trucks, I should say, we can reduce the fuel consumption and the CO2 footprint by 90%. And the total cost of ownership for the operation comes down by 30%. So again, massive saving in their operation with a good impact, of course, on sustainability. One of my favorite examples is uh, precision milling. So think turbines that go into aircraft engines. That's a high precision manufacturing process takes a lot of time and uh, there is no industry that has figured out how to get the yields north of 60, 65 percent. And those of you that are in the manufacturing business understand that those levels of yield are very, very costly. It means you're scrapping essentially 25 percent to 30 percent of what you produce and that's expensive equipment. So for them every percentage improvement in yield is significant. So we worked with uh, the Industry 4.0 program in Germany where they have a lot of experimentation around industry development and place sensors on the turbines as they get milled. Uh, being able then to detect small vibrations before they cause any damage to the turbine, you can slow down the process, recalibrate and move on. So you don't waste the blades or the turbine. Uh, increasing the yield by 15 to 20 percent one factory operator, uh, well, one company that has factories across the globe saves $400 million a year by being able to improve the yield. So massive numbers, of course, in terms of savings. But maybe more interesting, or also interesting, uh, in doing that, they also save 300 metric tons of CO2. That's the direct effect of being more effective in their operation. But what is even more stunning is that by having higher precision in their process, their estimates are that they're actually allowing an airline engine to operate more effectively, reducing the fuel consumption of the airline engine by 2%. That is um, 16 million metric tons of CO2 emissions. That's basically the city of Stockholm's annual CO2 footprint. And we're not super dirty over there. But that's, uh, that's just to put it into perspective, it's massive, the impact that smart manufacturing can have on society and, of course, businesses as well. Let's see. Um, I'll stay in the manufacturing space. I think Tim touched upon it, and, and so did uh, Michel. Uh, the average factory today is, is wired. Everything is wired. 85% plus is wired. Each, well, let me see if I get the numbers right now, each foot of cabling in a factory is about $75. There is an average of 15 feet of wiring tied into any machine. So think $1,000 a machine of cables. And then there is the connectivity device about $600 on each machine. So there is big money involved. So a wireless proposition to a smart manufacturing site, taking out the cabling and replacing that device with a wireless device saves the operator a lot of money in the cost of installation. Add to that the fact that industries want to have agility and flexibility on their shop floor, which is impossible if everything is wired down. So start thinking about wireless robots. Now with high performance batteries, they can be entirely unplugged, which gives you tremendous flexibility on the shop floor. Massive, massive values to be realized. So much so that we were pitching, we thought, um, autonomous driving to the CEO of Scania, the big trucking company, and the conversation ended up, when can I get your robots together with ABB and to my factory because I'm much more interested in the direct impact on my manufacturing site. So the, all this to say that there is a huge opportunity out there. 5G will make a massive impact. That is why there is a race going on globally for cities, countries, to build out infrastructure across the nation and to activate the ecosystem of innovation around them. You saw probably earlier this week on Monday, the city of Shanghai came out with a big bang about the network that they intend to build during this year. That's all to stimulate local innovation and investment to create applications for these type of networks to deliver the type of services I talked about. And they will probably be the least successful ones. They will come up with much more interesting stuff over the next coming years. That's the race we're talking about, and that is why it is so important for us to continue leading. The US is first out of the gate, but others can potentially run a lot faster. And Michelle talked about all of the key uh, hinders that we have in front of us, the roadblocks. Spectrum, I won't dwell on that. You'll hear more about that during the day. I'll be shocked otherwise. 
Zoning and permitting, see a great effort by FCC Chairman Pai, big supporter of uh, how they are driving the acceleration of the small cell deployments. We need to do more here together as an industry. There is 45,000 municipalities across the US for each of our customers to come to terms with before they can deploy a site, 45,000. That's gonna slow us down. So we need to find a way and the appeal is to the FCC and CTIA to work with us and our partners on coming up with more standardized, harmonized small cell solutions so we can run faster. Otherwise, others will catch up and they will leave us behind. And with that, I'm on time, so I will, I will uh, thank you for listening. I'm super excited. The US is in a tremendous position, first out of the gate. And don't forget, the ability of innovation in the US and the venture capital, which is essentially unlimited in the US, makes for a great recipe for success. For in, we did it in 4G, we wanna do it again in 5G because I think it's gonna be even more foundational because of industries transforming at the same time. Thanks for your attention, have a great day.